I work in social and environmental impact, which means I spend a lot of my day thinking about some big, hairy problems. Think climate change or social injustice. And I didn't get into this work by accident. I have been addicted to problem solving for most of my life. Some people, like my mom, my husband, my boss, my sister, my kids, most of my friends, and probably my dog, might say, I'm a chronic problem solver, a fixer. And it's not just the big stuff. I like small problems too. If you hand me a necklace chain with a knot in it, you are not getting it back until it's undone. You know when one of your drawstrings disappears? Yeah, I'm your gal. I'll check your hair for lice. I will help you get your keys out of your locked car. I'm the first one to tell you if you've got a little bit of spinach right there and I might even try to get it out for you. As a kid, I like to tell people what to do. I actually still really like to tell people what to do. I feel like I'm helping, offering free advice, though it's not always seen that way. At 16, I told my parents that they were clearly not happily married and they should get a divorce. Problem, solution. Now, this fixation of mine can be a gift. I have helped so many friends through a marital challenge or a job change or even a fashion crisis. But there are also those times when my determination to solve a problem becomes the problem itself. Most recently, this has been with my daughter who just graduated from high school. Yeah, she is among the thousands of teens around the world who graduated from high school during COVID-19. These kids lost their prom, the end of their high school sports career, their senior week, their senior trip, and the moment that marks 13 years of hard work, high school graduation. Now, the thing about my daughter is she is no stranger to disappointment. For two years running in fifth and sixth grade when playing volleyball and soccer, her teams never won a single game, not one. I kept wanting a win and she kept playing and having fun. It was like the pizza parties and snack time were the highlights, not the scoring. For all eight years of doing musical theater, hoping one time to get the leading role, it never happened. I felt the loss every time, and she persevered. She showed resilience, seemed unflappable. I felt deflated. One time, she came bounding in the house so excited, announcing, I got the crow in The Wizard of Oz. Oh, finally her breakthrough role. You are the scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz? That's amazing. She looked confused. No, Mom, I'm one of three crows in scene two. I had to bite my tongue from asking, what crows in scene two? Instead, I just responded, that's great. You are going to be so good. And honestly, she was so good. And then the letdowns got more personal. Eighth grade and freshman year, her friend groups changed a lot. Her longtime friends were no longer her friends, and her new friends came and went. Now, this may sound familiar to you. Adolescents, kids are cruel, and friendships change in high school. A lot of kids go through a rough patch. They make movies about the mean girls in high school, like the one called Mean Girls. But she cried a lot in those years, and it scared me. At one point, she said she felt depressed, so I sent her to therapy. She started eating lunch in the bathroom a few times a week and would call me crying. I listened. I ached for her. I tried to make her feel better. I bought her little gifts, a set of be happy cards and a gratitude journal, convinced that those things would turn it around. But they didn't. Her bad days became my bad days too. And then sophomore year, junior year, Things got worse, and then a lot worse. 
fast. She started cutting class and stopped doing her schoolwork. She was lying and sneaking out and lashing out. Things were spiraling downhill so fast and I was just trying to keep it from hitting bottom. The day we learned that she had cut herself with a razor blade for the first time, I took a leave of absence from work. I was now in full-time rescue mode as she became addicted to vaping, was getting drunk and started smoking weed every single day to dull her pain. I called doctors. I took her in for a mental health assessment. I kept trying to fix it, fix her until I couldn't anymore. It was December of her junior year and we dropped her off at a wilderness therapy program. That's where struggling kids go to live off the grid for a number of weeks and do some deep transformative work. It wasn't until after she was gone that I was told that my problem solving ways were probably part of the problem. I was told that maybe I was a rescuer and that I hadn't given her a chance to learn valuable coping skills when she was younger. Learning to struggle and suffer is part of growing up, they explained. As things had gotten harder for her, I tried harder to make it better, to make it stop hurting so much. Even in her early years, when she was dealing with loss so well, I may have overcompensated. I learned words like enmeshed, that I may have been overly involved and emotionally attached to her experiences. I was told to practice detachment. Now, those were a lot of new words and a lot of new information to digest. I had invested so much in being a good mom, whatever that means. And I know that I have no idea what I'm doing in this job of motherhood. I've made mistakes, but I'd read books and listened to podcasts and saw experts speak about raising self-reliant kids. I believed in the blessing of a skin knee and I wanted my kids to learn how to deal with failure and discomfort. But I was starting to realize that I couldn't deal with it. I was the one who couldn't tolerate the discomfort of her emotions. She came home the summer before her senior year, sober, stable, self-aware with a toolkit of coping skills at the ready. We agreed she couldn't go back to her same high school, too many triggers, so she started at a brand new high school for her senior year where she knew no one. That was rough. The difference now was that she could cope in healthy ways with all that disappointment. Now me, a recovering rescuer, kept jumping in and trying to problem solve when I'd see her struggle, but now she could tell me, hey mom, you don't need to solve that for me. We were learning together. She was learning how to manage her difficult feelings as they would come up using her new coping skills. And I was learning how to manage mine, sometimes with the help of a therapist and sometimes with the help of wine. And then coronavirus hit. Shelter in place started the week she turned 18. So we canceled her big birthday party. She still had a great day. And while she's sad she never got a high school prom, she had fun doing fake prom outside with her boyfriend. I was watching. She was coping so well through such a difficult time. I might even say she was thriving. She was sleeping more and playing guitar, exercising and FaceTiming. You add all the binge watching and she might say she was living her best life. Me, not my best life. I was dwelling on all that she lost. As graduation day drew closer, the fixer in me started freaking out. See, I had a vision of doing an entire reenactment of graduation in our backyard just for her. We would have chairs six feet apart for family and friends. She would walk across our deck to receive her diploma from her dad. I would give a commencement speech that would be so touching that everybody would cry. And she'd give the valedictorian speech, of course, and talk about all that she'd learned. We would be so inspired. I was ready to do cardboard cutouts for everyone that couldn't be there in person. I had picked out my dress. I was excited. 
she was less so. I pitched her on my graduation plan and she listened and said, yeah, mom, that's okay. I'll probably just hang out with friends, but you could make me a video. A video. I was excited and then crushed. I wanted to save her from another disappointment, to keep her from living through another loss, but I couldn't. Graduation came and went. We took family photos, picked up takeout, and yeah, watched that video I had made for her. And then she went out with friends. For the next few days, she was sullen and moody. It was hard, she said, to see all the pictures on social media of her friends from kindergarten graduating from the high school that she left just one year before. She was sad that she didn't get to graduate with them, that she didn't get invited to any of the parties, that her high school experience was so different from so many. She felt left out. I felt like the only thing I could do was give her space. Now, you may have figured this out already, but it took me a while to realize that my graduation plan was not just about saving her from a graduation. It was about trying to save her from a lifetime of disappointments, the many traumas her therapist had called them that she'd learned to overcome while she was away, the one she'd overcome without me. I know now that she has everything she needs inside of her to take on life's disappointments as they come. I just need to get out of the way. That little girl who was so excited to be the crow in The Wizard of Oz, the one of three crows in scene two, she is the young woman before me now who is so excited to get on with her life, to go to college, study psychology, and help struggling teens. I made a decision then to stop rescuing my daughter when she doesn't need rescuing. I need to trust that she's gonna figure it out. This pandemic has been a reminder that there is so little in life that we can control. And my daughter taught me to stop trying to control the things that I can't. I'm a chronic problem solver and maybe you are too. I'd like to think that I'm a more enlightened one now. My call to all of us fixers is to stop trying to control and solve things that we think are problems. We gotta let go. Don't get me wrong, if you hand me a necklace chain with a knot in it, I'm gonna try and get it out. I just might not be able to. And I'm still gonna give you unsolicited advice. You can take it or leave it. And on second thought, I don't actually wanna check your hair for lice. What I do want is for all of us to see the global shift that is occurring with everything going on in our world right now. My hope is that we see it as a time to learn and grow within ourselves, looking inside versus only outside for change. Let this shift be not just global, but personal as well. Thank you for listening.